Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Good evening and welcome to our first set of notes for second semester. Tonight we are starting um, our unit on the Industrial Revolution and the changing of culture in America. So our inquiry question is, how did innovation affect society during the Industrial Revolution? So please set up your Cornell notes and let's begin. So the Industrial Revolution was a period in time where it went from humans making everything by hand to factories and machines starting to make things instead of um, the humans. So it replaced the hand tools, large-scale manufacturing, replaced farming um, as a main form of work. So as we go through today, we're going to focus on some of the inventions of the Industrial Revolution. And then as we go through the week, we'll look at the impacts on the North, impacts on the South, um, and how it changed culture throughout the United States. So we'll start with Samuel Slater. Samuel Slater was a guy from Britain. He was a British mechanic um, who worked on machines in Britain. He leaves Britain, coming to the United States, disguised as a farmer. He immigrated to the United States um, wanting to um, get free of Britain. However, Britain had passed a law that anybody working in um, the manufacturing industry, the mechanics, the people that understood how the machines worked in Britain, were not allowed to bring those secrets to any other country. However, because he disguised himself as a farmer, he was able to slip through and make it to the United States. By 1793, he opened his first mill in Rhode Island at a place called Pawtucket. And from here, we're going to see major and rapid growth. So these are called textile mills, or mills where um, they make clothing and other type of cloth. These mills were located, as you can see in the picture, on rivers because they needed water or hydropower to power the um, factories. It was illegal again to leave England with this knowledge of how this machine worked because England did not want their secrets to get out because they were leading the world in textile manufacturing. However, it got to the United States. From this point, we go into this thing called the factory system. The United States switches from a time where everything's handmade, or just about everything's handmade, hand done, to now factories. People are going to specialize in some type of job and make that one product that um, that factory is going to um, focus on. So we have these textile mills, as you can see. If you notice, there's a lot of women working in the textile mills, and each machine looks almost identical because each woman's doing pretty much the same thing over and over throughout the day. One of the people later on that will develop this system and make it huge is this system called the Lowell system. In this system, they could both weave the thread or spin the thread and weave the cloth all in the same factory. And this will lead to lots of work for women at the time. So a lot of young women in the Northeast living on farms, not married, so what are they going to do? They don't have a husband yet. They need to start making some money. Um, so they look to these low mills to get a job. If you look at their schedule, they would start early in the morning, first bell, 4.30 or 4 a.m. Last bell, 6.30 p.m. Most of these um, low mills, the women would move away from home and live at the mill. They would be boarded, similar to like living on campus in college. Um, they would get paid two to four dollars a week for at this time that's 
a lot more money than they could have made doing the other jobs that they were qualified for. But they worked long days. They had to pay some to the mill to live um, there. But it starts leading to this mass production of textiles. Because of that, the mills need cotton and thread. Um, that we'll see in a little while. But why would they stay in the northeast? You don't see many textile mills in the south. They're mainly all in the northeast. It's because they have fast rivers. The faster the river, the quicker the wheels can spin to produce the power to run the machines. Um, also, there's a lot of people willing to work in factories in the northeast. In the south, they want to work on farms. They have the big open land. Um, you don't have as much of that because of the geography of the northeast. It's rocky. It's rough. Not as good for farming. Second inventor that we're going to talk about is Eli Whitney. Um, he began by proposing the mass production of guns um, using water power. This was because the U.S. military and government were looking for a new way to produce guns. Um, and he came up with this idea of what's called interchangeable parts. These interchangeable parts um, would allow products to be made quicker and easier to repair or and or assemble um, the products um, throughout the life of the product. Prior to this time, you would if you were making a gun, you would make the entire gun, and if any part broke, you would have to get a new gun. With interchangeable parts, um, they could make different pieces of the gun in different places, and then somebody else will put them all together. If one of those pieces broke, they can now go buy a new piece, just that part instead of the whole gun, and piece it together. It's similar to almost everything we buy today. Cell phone. The case breaks. You don't have to buy a new phone to get a new case. The battery dies. You could buy just the battery instead of the whole phone again. Um, Eli Whitney promised to build over 10,000 muskets in a two-year time span. Um, which he would then travel to Washington, D.C. and show how does this um, thing work. However, even with interchangeable parts in this factory system, manu manufacturing or the producing of goods and services in the United States was growing very slowly. Um, it will become standard, though, to make things with interchangeable parts. A few years later, Eli Whitney um, develops a machine called the Cotton Gin. This we'll get into later in the week, but it drastically changes um, the life of people in the South, specifically slaves. It's a machine that was used to remove the seeds from the cotton. If you notice, there's a hand crank. They would crank, put the seeds in and crank it. Put the seeds in and crank it, and when it would separate the clean cotton from all the seeds that are in the cotton. Um, Eli Whitney says, quote, one man will clean 10 times as much cotton as he can in any other way before known and is also clean it much better than in the usual mode. This machine may be turned by water or with a horse with the greatest ease and one man and a horse will do more than 50 men with the old machine. So now they can mass um, grow cotton and get it ready to sell very quickly, which make, means the South has a new way to make a lot of money very quick. Number three, Robert Fulton. He invents the steamboat. Um, prior to this time, boats mainly are going to be either um, used oars or wind power, sailboats. Um, he develops um, a boat called the Claremont after testing a handful of other boats prior to that in France in 1803. This increases trade and profit throughout the country because this boat is perfect for the rivers. It can go up and down the rivers very easily, meaning you can move goods much quicker. And since you can move it quicker, you can do it for cheaper um, and can get it there fast. By the 1840s, there's over 500 steamboats in use across the United States, up and down the rivers. 
Eventually, there will even be steamboats that can go across the ocean. Number four, Samuel Morris. He invents the te telegraph. What's the telegraph? It's a machine that sends pulses of electric current turned in um, that at the other end will get turned into a clicking sound. Samuel Morris had studied electricity and magnetism and realized that with this machine, he can send these pulses through a wire over a great distance. Prior to this time, if you're in Washington, D.C. and want to get news to New York, you have to get on a horse or send somebody on a horse to get the message up there. With the telegraph, they're able to send these messages through wires, and a person in Washington, D.C. could get the information in New York within minutes. His partner, Alfred Lewis Vail, created what's called Morse code. Most of you have probably heard of Morse code. It's the beeping. Um, the beeps turn into dashes or dots, which then is translated based on Morse code. Certain dots represent certain letters, and then you spell it out. This takes off huge in 1844 when, for the first time, it's used with the Democratic National Convention and the news of who was elected to be the Democratic um, person for president that year. Next, John Deere. He invents a steel plow because in the late 1830s, he sees that it's very hard to plow the ground um, when he was out visiting some friends. And he invents a plow that now can be pulled. It's steel, and then it can be pulled by horses as well. By the mid-1840s, he's selling over 1,000 plows a year. It's much easier to turn over the land before planting. And then Cyrus McCormick. This is the last guy we'll talk about tonight. Another farming invention, which is called the Grain Reaper or the McCormick Reaper. The McCormick Reaper is just a... Another way to harvest the crop, to cut down the wheat, um, instead of having to go do it all by hand. However, it wasn't just the invention that changed the country. It was also the method um, to encourage sales. He won. He, he advertised his product. People didn't advertise much prior to this. He would give demonstrations of the product so people could actually see it in use. He provided a repair and spare parts department. So for those interchangeable parts, there was a place for people to go buy the part only so they didn't have to buy the whole new machine. And then finally, he let the customers buy on credit, saying, it's yours now, and you're going to pay me this much money over the course of a certain time period. Both this and the steel plow by John Deere allowed farmers to plant and harvest huge crops that they were never able to do before. Um, it changes farming, it changes the size of farms, um, and th we start to see a divide between the north and south based on industry versus farming and the growth of both of those. So, as you wrap up your notes here, how do you think these inventions changed the culture of America? And then I want you to think for tomorrow, what inventions have change your culture in your lifetime? What new things have been invented since you were born that weren't around prior to you being born? And how have they changed your life or the life of your friends and family around you? Come prepared tomorrow to wrap up your Cornell notes and discuss um, some of these inventions and some other inventions that were not covered tonight. Have a good evening.